Hi folks, and welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. I'm making this video to be an introductory video on the idea of mechanical vibrations. All right, <clears throat> so imagine this mass spring system. Whoops. <clears throat> this mass spring system right here. We know that um, the spring has a force constant, let's say K, and the mass has some sort of mass. We'll just call this M for the problem. And imagine that the equilibrium position, meaning when the spring is not compressed, is here in green at x equals zero, meaning that's where this object would be sitting if the spring, isn't, the spring is not compressed in any way, shape, or form. Now imagine that somebody applies a force in this direction, compressing the spring, an amount that I called A there, and releases this system. And for this example, we're going to assume that that there's negligible friction to worry about and just talk about the mechanical vibration itself. So this object, if released, is going to oscillate back and forth like this under the influence of the spring. And I drew a series of pictures here. This is my picture one. At that point, x is equal to minus a, whatever a is, some number, and the object is not moving. Picture two here is meant to be very generic. I have it over on the right, but really this dot for the center of mass of the object could be on either side. But an important thing to realize is it's not an endpoint. And my third picture here is another endpoint here. So assuming no energy loss, this distance again to the center of mass would be whatever A is. All right. <clears throat> now, we expect that the object is going to oscillate back and forth. And if we think about, well, what type of functions exhibit that behavior? Well, sines and cosines do. So we would expect a solution if we were to plot position against time, x against t, to look something like this. In this case, rather than a sine or a cosine wave, we would actually expect a, a cosine wave rather than a sine wave, just because of the observation here that at t equals 0, x is some number, a. On our graph, the maximum distance from equilibrium, which is this distance on the graph here, here, and here, that's referred to as amplitude. The distance time-wise to complete one complete cycle, that's this distance on the graph, that's called your period. Period is usually denoted with a capital T as opposed to little t here, which is representing just, you know, time as a variable. So now the million dollar question is, how do we get from this, the physical problem, to this, the position function and, and time information? And that's what this video is about. Well, there's a couple of different ways here. So in both my physics classes, or all my physics classes, I usually try to... Um, uh, merge, you know, Newton's second law, right, Newton 2, with principles of work and energy. Both of these concepts can be applied here, and I'm going to talk about how to apply both of them. Now let's talk about Newton's second law, and let's think about a free body of this object. Now, the vertical forces are not important for this problem in any way, shape, or form, so I'm not even going to bother putting in a normal force or a gravitational force. The force exerted by the spring onto that object, all right, now what you have to realize here is the way I've worded this is that the, equal, uh, the equilibrium position was supposed to be when the center of mass is here. If the center of mass is to the right, then the spring force is to the left. Now, Hooke's law is that the spring force is proportional to the distance that the spring is compressed or stretched. That's not quite good enough magnitude-wise because, um, or let me back up, that's not quite good enough for our equation of motion because over on the right, if we've got x positive, to the right, this expression gives a positive value, which would mean the force is to the right, but it's not, it's to the left. So a minus sign in front of this correctly gives the force direction on either side. Try it. When the mass is over here, 
x is a negative value, but the spring is pushing to the right. right when the object is over here, f x is a positive value, and the spring is pushing left. So minus kx whoops, um, correctly gives the force, magnitude, and direction for all time. So when we apply Newton's second law, which is net force equals ma, right, the left-hand side is minus kx. Okay, now, the acceleration, let's talk about different ways to write that acceleration. In the overwhelming majority of problems that we do in a physics class, we usually just write A for acceleration because in a lot of the problems, the acceleration is constant and that's good enough. In this problem, acceleration is not constant, so this is not a good enough way to write this. Another possible way to write the acceleration is dv dt because that's what acceleration is, the time derivative of your velocity. This is not a desirable way to write this either because if you look at the number of variables in the problem, it's now a three variable problem, x, v, and t. So we go, well, that's maybe not a huge or most advantage, the best way to do it. But the third way is we can write our acceleration as the second derivative of position with respect to time, right? Because remember, v is dx dt in this problem. So dv dt would be the second derivative of x with respect to time. And this is a good way to write it because now it's a two variable problem and it's pretty easily solved. We can put it in its standard form, which would be d squared x dt squared plus k over m times x equals zero. And we can then move on with our solutions from there. I'm not going to do that in this video. I'm going to save that for another one. All right, this video is about how to go from the physical problem to this function. And I think I'll save the to the function part for a second video. All right. <clears throat> the other thing I'd like to point out is we can use work energy methods also to analyze this problem. All right, if I write out a work energy theorem between positions 1 and 2, PE1 would represent the total potential energy in picture 1. Now the only potential energy in picture 1 is an elastic potential energy. And just as a little reminder, elastic potential energies look like this, 1 half kx squared. So the potential energy at position 1 can be written 1 half k a squared. A is the distance that that spring is stretched. And keep in mind that a is just some number. Kinetic energy in picture one, zero, because it's at rest. Work term, zero. There are no non-conservative forces acting in this problem at all. Okay, now here's where the action starts happening. I need to give myself a little more room here. Whoops. Darn it. Okay, the PE2 term. So picture two he is here, and the spring is stretched in amount x. So it has a potential energy of 1 half kx squared. In addition to that, in picture two, that object is moving. So it's going to have a kinetic energy of 1 half mv squared. Now, that equation is pretty useful. And if we weren't interested in time information, if it was just position information, we'd be pretty good to go here. You tell me an x, I'll tell you a v. Or tell me a v, I'll tell you an x. Now, again, you'll notice I, that there's no time information anywhere in sight in that equation. But what we can do is we can change it to introduce time information. Okay? The derivative you can think of as an operator, something that you do to... Uh, things, operates on things. And if we take the time derivative, d dt, of this entire equation, right, the time derivative of this term is zero. 
because the one half k a those are all just constants and of course the time derivatives of all these zeros are zeros okay now the time derivative of this term the one half is a constant the k is constant but the x is changing so that thing's time derivative is k x dx dt right because remember you have to chain rule it all right the next term one half is not changing the mass is not changing but the velocity is so the time derivative of the next term is m v dv dt Now that equation looks quite a bit messier than the one on the left, but it cleans up pretty fast. First notice this, dx dt is the velocity, so these actually reduce. And this term, d dt of v, now remember v is dx dt, so that term is second derivative of x with respect to time. So if you take this equation and rewrite it, like this, just by replacing the d v dt with its second derivative counterform and dividing by mass, we get exactly the same equations, right? So you can use either Newton's second law or principles of work and energy to derive what are called the equations of motion for a system. I think I'll save the what do we do with those equations for the next video. All right. Have a great day.